With me on stage are three of the most accomplished leaders in investing. They're all, as you'll find out in a moment, original thinkers who have successfully steered their firms to new heights in the decades since the financial crisis. Immediately to my left is Mary Erdos. She is the CEO of J.P. Morgan Asset and Wealth Management, one of the world's largest and most diversified businesses in the industry. To her left is Jim Coulter. He's the co-CEO and founding partner of TPG, a pioneer in growth equity and social impact investing. And to his left is Ken Griffin. He's the founder and CEO of Citadel, a firm that uniquely is at the same time one of the biggest and most innovative hedge funds and also happens to be one of the leading market makers. We can't look forward into the future, I think it's safe to say, without considering the past. And two weeks ago, as you all know, we marked, certainly didn't celebrate, uh, the 10 year anniversary of the financial crisis. The only thing we're celebrating perhaps is the fact that we made it this far without another crisis. <laughs> um, panelists, as you consider the performance of the economy over the past decade, how markets have evolved, and the changes you've witnessed in your industry, I want us to talk about what lessons we've learned. Because the lessons we've learned from the past obviously guide our behavior in the future. Mary, why don't you start us off? So many lessons learned, uh, probably too much for, for the time we have allotted today. I, I would just point out the obvious. The, the last great financial crisis was, had the seeds of any other crisis. It was a crisis of confidence. Um, unfortunately, that crisis of confidence came in confidence in the financial institutions that move money around the world and lend money. It came in the crisis of confidence of where you keep your cash, everything from the deposits in a bank to the money market funds and how they would fund themselves the next day. And that had come from very subtle rule changes that had happened over time, whether it was in the mortgage market, uh, where there was an enhancement of lower income housing so that you found yourself with loan to value ratios of 97% on 40% of the mortgages, outstanding. So what did you think was gonna happen when housing prices fell only 5%? Everyone would be underwater. And what did you think was gonna happen when the SEC uniform rule changed that broker dealers could, instead of having 12 to one leverage, could have 35 to one leverage, a small change in 2003. How long was that gonna take before it would manifest itself? About four years. And we saw the first seeds of it, which Ken will know very well, uh, in the Statar markets in the summer of 2007. And so a lot of this, you could see itself in its making, but that's not what happens. You have to wait until there's a run on something, when you don't believe that it's going further uh, up. And if you don't believe it's going further up, you come out. And, and that's, and that's the essentially what happened. It just happened across a number of different aspects of the market. And so all those lessons learned are exactly what we sit here face today. If it looks too good to be true, guess what? It eventually will be. If you don't understand what you're buying, don't buy it. Pools of things where you can't see the underlying securities and you think it's just diversification that will get you through it, it won't. And so how you go through all of the investments you will do in the future is no different than the thought process you would have in the past, but, it's, but it's, how you, it's how you keep that discipline each and every day in what you're invested in, how much is too much, and when something is too much of a good thing, you gotta, you gotta take your cards off the table and, and move forward, and, and that's what the three of us try and do each and every day. Before Jim and Ken jump in here, Mary, you made an important point, and, and we all know it to be true, which is that if something appears to be too good to be true, it probably is. Is there anything you can see today that looks too good to be true? Oh, lots of things. What's oh, at the top I of the mean, list? everything from housing prices in certain parts of the world to currency prices in certain parts of the world. I mean, you can't possibly think we are in a normal world when we have $11 trillion that was thrown at the market to buy whatever to keep things propped up. Add to that a nice little tax reform in the United States of America to help that. And you, ha and you have negative yields in you know, 40% of Europe and Japan. This, this is like not normal. There are not normal things. Not normal things don't end well. The problem is all the stress testing in the world isn't telling us what it's gonna manifest itself next because everything it seems 
so benign. Everyone is so comfortable, and that's exactly when you need to be the most uncomfortable. You're nodding your head, Jim. Uh, no, I, uh, I watch superpower movies with my kids now, and uh, superhero movies, and I've learned that when you have superpowers, it's often the flip side that gets you in trouble. So Superman has kryptonite. And so what I'm spending a lot of time thinking about, Mary, is what's gone so well that it might go poorly? It was housing the last cycle. And two things I'm keeping my eye on. Um, we have been fueled by an incredible tech boom. What might the other side of that be? And secondly, we've been in a period of time where open trade borders and other international relationships have helped fuel the markets. and, and those have been great for us, and what might the other side of that look like? How about you, Ken? What lessons would you draw from the past, from the post-crisis experience, particularly through your eyes and, and those of your colleagues at Citadel? So just, just to go back to some of Mary's commentary, mm -hmm. I, I think J.P. Morgan was incredibly fortunate to only suffer a crisis of confidence. Uh, it's a real statement about the management team that you had at J.P. Morgan at the time that your core business was largely unscathed. But many of your contemporaries incurred tens or hundreds of billions of dollars of losses related to their bad loan portfolios. And that's really the, the cause of the great financial crisis. It wasn't that Lehman Brothers blew up over a weekend. It's that we had laid the kindling wood throughout the financial services system with the enormity of losses that were going to come from both subprime mortgages and from levered finance. Jumping forward over the last 10 years, what, what have been some of the salient, salient ways to, to prosper? Number one has been this huge shift in one's core competency moving away from just fundamentals to understanding the political realm. We've gone through, in the great financial crisis, an alphabet soup of programs by the US and European governments and the Japanese, as, as Mary pointed out, intended to unleash the animal spirits. So quantitative easing has really been, how do we encourage Americans and Europeans to take more risk? And there's no doubt that by the metrics, the governments have been incredibly successful. If we look at levered loan statistics, for example, we're at an all-time record in both the issuance of high-yield debt and at the lack of covenants in this debt. So ironically, in the 10-year anniversary of, of the failure of the US financial system, we are in this debt-fueled buying binge that is pushing up valuations, that is, that is laying, again, the seeds for the next crisis. So just to summarize, the OA crisis, it wasn't about Lehman Brothers, it wasn't about the investment banks, it was about the collapse of the US housing market, where millions of Americans lost trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a national economic catastrophe. But the post-financial crisis, the salient change has been the weight that all of us have to place on what's going to happen in Washington, what's going to happen at the European Central Bank as compared to strictly the fundamentals of the businesses or assets that we invest in. And that's been a real change over 10 years, frankly not one for the better. You know, I just, I just want to chime in on one thing Ken said because you, you talked about Ken being a market maker. He's one of the largest in the world. That's a really important fundamental shift from where we were before the great financial crisis. He just talked about the amount of debt that has increased in the world. The amount of debt that has increased is three to four fold, okay? Three to four fold. The groups that used to make that work going back and forth and make markets, i.e. step in when no one else is there, were the banks. They have shrunk their holdings by law from a trillion and a half to a trillion, so by a third. Okay, so when we need liquidity in the future. Comes from different places. Yes, but guess what he is? He's not a bank, he's a fiduciary. He has a fiduciary obligation to care only about his investors and his shareholders. He doesn't have an obligation to step in and make markets for the sake of making markets. It will be a very different playbook when we go through the liquidity crunch that eventually will come. Will it? You know, I, I think this is always a, an interesting argument that we hear from our, our friends in the banking side of the industry, which is what is the role that we're going to play in the next great, great market correction? And if you replay history, go, go to any period in, in a period of market price adjustment, no one buys the asset that represents the falling knife. Banks don't do it. Specialists don't do it. Markets correct in price terms 
very quickly and very suddenly. The role of the market maker is to maximize the availability of liquidity to all participants throughout that journey. That's the role of the market maker. How efficiently can we bring buyers and sellers together? Because the perception and reality that you can create liquidity helps to calm markets. So for example, the New York Stock Exchange, where we're the largest specialists, we've gone to great lengths to work with the New York Stock Exchange and the SEC to re-architect trading protocols to minimize the periods of time in which stocks do not trade. That's all about creating the confidence that investors should have in the liquidity and stability of the U.S. equity market. And we take great pride in that work. If I, if I think about today versus 10 or 15 years ago, or 30 years ago, what's important to understand is that the role of the large investment banks has been supplanted by not only firms such as Citadel Securities, mm -hmm. but by a whole ecosystem of statistical arbitrage and other short-term trading shops that will absorb risk that comes to market quickly. So by, by forcing this change on the banking systems that the regulators did, and I'm not gonna debate the pros and cons of that, we've re-architected the entire value chain, the entire ecosystem, in a way that I think will actually work better in the next crisis. The liquidity will not evaporate as quickly as it did, for example, and the, the price gaps so, you know, we've seen time and again in securities won't be as, as severe? If, if we look at who withdraws liquidity from markets in times of duress, it's the players with the least capability in forecasting price. So if I look, for example, at the flash rally in treasuries, a number of the banks were the first to withdraw liquidity because they had less ability to see the overall mosaic of the market. So one of the great things that we've done at Citadel Securities is we're able to understand the price of literally thousands of securities simultaneously and where should price be on any one security given the mosaic. A number of your banks that don't have the capabilities that we have in artificial intelligence, machine learning, modern predictive analytics can't maintain price integrity in periods of chaos. Jim, I want to come to you on a related point here because what we're talking about at the moment are public markets. Right? What happens in public markets when there's a crisis of confidence and, and, and the evaporation, if you will, of liquidity? Your firm operates largely in private markets and there's been an enormous shift of assets from public to private markets. We need only look at the number of publicly listed U.S. companies and the number of private equity firms that have risen to match the number of U.S. Uh, stocks. How do you think that plays into what we've just been discussing here? I love listening to Ken because he lives at the coal face of the market every day. I tend to live four or five years out. So you're watching a change at that coal face. I'm watching uh, changes in the underlying economy that are driving our investment decisions. And for me, the headline is that the change in the rate of change is what's affecting our world. So I grew up in a world with Darwinian business. Every day you just get a little bit better. And it turns out Darwin was a little wrong. If you look at evolutionary biology, basically they now believe in punctuated equilibrium. Things go along and then everything changes all at once. The dinosaurs are gone and then they go along again. And so across the economy, we're seeing a world where massive changes are happening very quickly. And um, so, for example, we're very focused on the idea of data as a new oil. We're focused on tech lash. We're focused on the point you just made, which is there's a rise in the private markets. So take the unicorns. Uh, we started talking about unicorns in 2015. There was 150 of them. They're companies that are private in over a billion dollars in valuation. Today, there's 260 of them. They're a $900 billion asset class that didn't exist five years ago. How's that gonna work out? How are your clients gonna invest in those when they're not in the public market? So we're seeing on one hand at the coalface these radical changes, and then in the background, we're seeing societal changes that I think are going to drive a lot of the investment opportunities going forward. Could you continue? Because Ken brought up three words or four words might have been three. If there was a big in front of data, there were two, and then there was five. Machine learning and artificial intelligence, or AI. 
So data, where, where, yeah, let me, data is the new oil. So I, I, we've talked about big data for a while, just like we talk about autonomous vehicles, but big data is happening. And essentially the parallel that I've been working through is if you look at the 20th century, it was largely shaped by oil. Politically, the products, the airline industry, um, over and over again, oil shows up, Pearl Harbor, you know, all driven by oil. And suddenly in the new era, we're refining a new asset, data, and we're beginning to see things like cyber attacks where, you know, when you spill oil, who takes care of it? When you spill data, who takes care of it? So at that moment, you have an extraordinary new market developing. At the same time, society, when the airplane was invented, it took society 50 years before you had an FAA. You know, society is going to have to catch up on data much faster. And so as an investor, you see both a new market occurring and society intersecting with that in a way that you have to understand before you can invest. And, and that kind of interaction to me is, is what is exciting and probably slightly separated from what's happening in the general economy, which is where I'm trying to mine opportunities today. If you're, if you're an investor today and you invest in private equity, in hedge funds, in public markets, and whatever, you you, you want that data to help you to make better decisions, right? So the use of data mostly heretofore was to be able to sell ads and to be able to figure out how to target who wants to buy this sweater or that, that car or these pair of shoes. The power of data is to make the investor smarter, make better decisions, know where you stand, know how you're tracking, the same as it is in health. The data that you get in the healthcare system today and five years from now will be so much more powerful in making you a smarter digester of that information and therefore taking care of your health. And so we, we have 60 million households in the United States of America. We have their credit card data. We have their, 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 their W, you know, all, all of their income data, all of their spend data. We know how much they spend on beer. We know how much they spend on vacations. We know how much they save. We know, how much, we know where they send it to. They, we know what their ecosystem is. And we don't want to take that data and use it to sell to be able to do something. We want to give it back to them and say, this is how you are in your cohort of people who look like you, who do the same things as you. Let's help you to see if you can make better decisions to have a greater financial outcome at the end. And so data can help the investor on that end to be able to make those wise decisions, but can also help each and every one of us. So we can have our own data. They have amazing amounts of data on the things that they invest in, as well as they have access to and can purchase data from all sorts of different spectrums. When you bring that to life, it just makes all those human decisions so much faster that you're making better decisions constantly over time. And that, that's going to help shape all industries, but certainly the investments. This is going to be a cool one, Mary. You know, we, uh, we own CAA, the talent agency, and you used to have to figure out who would be the best person to uh, plug your product. So we can take one of our clients, look at their entire social media following, we can look at the social media following of a, of a product, and we can basically match them up to predict who might be the right person to be your spokesman. Hmm. So this is a small thing, but it's a, just a, again, it taken the, hours, I would have months. taken hours, months, and yeah. got it wrong a lot. So I, you, know, you live in data in a, in a huge way, but the reason I bring it up is um, we're a day closer to the next uh, whatever problem it's going to be. It'll be a different thing than the last. But I think we can also find opportunities that are unlikely to be widely affected by that. We have to find trends that are going to play through that moment of dislocation, and that's in our world where we're trying to spend time. I, I think, though, it's, it's really important to keep in mind the, the great steps forward that humanity will take with this transformation. You know, one of my friends is very involved in the sequencing of DNA of a particular person's cancer. And a repository of this built across thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients allows the very targeted delivery of the right chemotherapy or the right approach to deal with any one person's own unique cancer. That will save lives. That will let a mother see her children graduate from high school. I grew up in South Florida. I grew up on a ro near a road that was one of the most dangerous roads in the United States because elderly people could not see the lights changing color and would consistently run red lights. 
think of how we will change the fatality rate with self-driving cars in some place like South Florida, where you have retirees looking to enjoy their golden years on the road, but they don't have the vision to be safe drivers. So there's gonna be just tremendous positive changes in society with respect to data. I, I think Jim, though, hit a very important keyword. It's big data. These approaches work really well when you have large volumes of data. So for example, when I have to think about a portfolio manager who makes 30 investment decisions a quarter, I don't have enough data to just by the numbers tell you that person's skill. There's still a huge range across the vast majority of problems for fundamental judgment by managers about the quality of the work their colleagues do, whether it's in sales or picking stocks or designing new bodies for cars. So I think as we've gone in this area and what we're all struggling with is a term we use internally, constructive paranoia. Uh, we're getting more worried as the markets get higher and later in the cycle, and yet there's an extraordinary amount of interesting things going on. And so what, you know, I'm sure you have the same problem, Mary. You have to both look forward and find areas that you can deploy in capital while perfecting, uh, while defending your flanks at, at all costs. That's exactly right. That's a convenient segue, I think, Mary, for this question about returns and growth, perhaps, that should, in theory, underlie investment returns over time. Um, we're nine and a half years into a bull market. It's been almost a straight line up for U.S. stocks. We are, for the most part, 30, 30 years into a bond bull market. Yields have only recently, in the past 18 months or so, begun to back up, and on a historical basis, they haven't backed up by a whole lot. If you cast your eye into the future, all three of you, what do you see? What does it look like? You gotta be careful, but there's tremendous opportunity. I mean, you just look, look at who Mayor Bloomberg has brought together here. I mean, look at this room. You've got some of the largest sovereign wealth fund investors, the largest private equity investors, the largest investors from America, from Latin America, from Europe. Everybody is here to try and figure out where is that nuanced opportunity. If you don't have to have your money trapped in something that has to have daily liquidity, you're paying a great premium for that. And you can find these opportunities in all of the different technologies, uh, disruptive investments, and, 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 and be able to, in real estate, et cetera. You, you will be able to deploy it through the cycle, right? Everybody's worried about the, should I be invested in the S&P 500 or not? It, it's not a decision for the people who are in charge of mass sums of money. When you're in charge of mass sums of money, like this room is, your responsibility is to manage that money through many, many cycles. And you need to make the decisions around the margin. Being out of the markets is the single most dangerous thing you can do for the corpus of the portfolio. I don't need to tell this room that the value of compounding over a 20-year cycle, if you miss just the top 10 days in the markets, cuts that return in half. If you miss the top 30 days, you have a negative return. If you just miss the top 30 days. So that's the corpus of the portfolio. That needs to keep going. You need to not be, be um, sidetracked by all of the machinations of what's going on in the market. Having said that, if you look at portfolios today, people who have been invested in equities straight up since then, you need to do a health check. You, you, you do a health check on your own body, hopefully at least once a year. Every day you're working on it from exercise, etc. You don't do the same thing. Most individuals don't do the same thing with their financial portfolio. They don't look at it. Their equities are probably way outsized if they've had them. Their, their fixed income portfolio has probably far too much duration, far too much credit risk, and it hasn't gone down, so why touch it? There's no money in cash because everybody around the world, uh, governments told you not to have cash. As a matter of fact, they would charge you if you had it. So you don't have any cash. So you don't have cash for the liquidity issues that you might need. And if you don't have that, you won't have the, the dry powder to be able to take advantage of the opportunities. And so that's when you look at the structure of the private equity firms and the hedge funds, they always have that dry powder to be able to take advantage of the second that next thing happens. 
And that's why it's so important to have the allocation to things like that and, and spend a lot of time with clients who do that. The, the flip side is the, is the person that's never recovered from 2008. They've never touched equity since then. That's the tragedy. Or, or the people who don't have access to those products. Right. They exist too. What do you say, Ken? So I, I think just you know, touching on, on what Mary's saying, I, I always say, unless, unless you tell me your position, all you have is an opinion. All right. My position today is very focused on managing the tail risks of a major market correction. Not that I believe one's going to happen tomorrow or the next day, but we are, we are late in a cycle. The animal spirits have been unleashed. And when these corrections occur, they happen with very little notice. If we go back to the crash of 87, there was a, a, a I, I believe it was an Iranian boat, like shot guns at a US warship. That was the big story that morning. And the stock market was down 20 some percent. Mm -hmm. No neon light says we're about to have a crash tomorrow. So you need to think about how do you have your position portfolio portfolio position today before the event happens. Now, now that I've given the sort of gloom and doom part of the speech, we are in a period of great growth in the United States. The Trump tax reform, giant adrenaline shot to the US financial market, giant adrenaline shot to corporate America. We've pushed growth up by at least one or 2%. We've driven unemployment almost to the boundaries. We're creating inflation on the back of this as we see for the first time in nine years, some real meaningful wage growth for Americans. So the economy is running hot right now. The Trump policies, whether it's deregulation, whether it's tax reform, certainly pushing corporate America to go, go, go. Go in terms of new plants and equipment, hiring people, so on and so forth. So we, we probably have another 18 to 24 months minimum in this cycle just on the back of the adrenaline rush from Trump's policies as he's really tried to reignite growth here in America. So if, if Mary is advocating a health check, you're advocating managing the tail risk, uh, we don't have a lot of liquidity, so we have to make long-term themes. And let me give you a couple of the swing thoughts in our mind as we're picking individual companies. First of all, alpha, not beta. Uh, there's times you just buy the market. We are worried about the tail risk you're worried about, so we're trying to buy individual company and uh, sector changes, dat data, things like experiences over things, which is a change in consumer behavior. Uh, and the second thing, generally, we're leaning into growth and disruption, which is a little bit counterintuitive because often as you get more conservative, you want to go back to the incumbent safe cash flow companies. But we're in an era where there is a devaluation of incumbency and a rise of insurgency. And if multiples are going to come in, I want something that will grow into that multiple degradation. So generally, we're holding back our deployment and moving towards alpha plays and situations where we think there is industry and sector growth that will overcome the inevitable correction, whenever it may be. A quick question to finish up the panel, and it's a question that follows from the, Ken, the point that Ken was just making. You're absolutely right. The neon sign does not flash and say the crisis is here. Here's the question. Do you have a sense, as far as the next crisis is concerned, how severe it's going to be relative to those that you've seen in your lifetime or you've studied? And if there's a place where it is likely to happen, you mentioned earlier, Ken, the buildup of leverage in different parts of the system than we had pre-crisis. Do you have a sense for where it might be? Mary, could you start with that? We run hundreds of stress tests every single day. And to think that somebody knows the actual outcome of what's going to happen next is full of a lot of confidence. <laughs> it is not going to be where everyone's looking, right? It's just like kids on a soccer field. When the soccer ball goes down, they all go there. That is not where the problem is. We have obsessed on lots of different things over the last 10 years to try and fix problems. That's not where the crisis will be. It will be from something we can't predict and that won't be the issue. It will be the second or third derivative of that that will spill over to things that we can't calculate. It will probably be cyber related, but it won't be cyber for cyber's sake. It will affect an industry that spills over and affects things that cause a run on something. 
And that's what everyone has to be prepared for, and liquidity is the most important way to prepare for that. Jim, how do you think about that? You know, I still read the paper every morning, and when I have my coffee and I lay the business section and the front section next to each other, I think I'm reading two totally different worlds. And so how that works itself out over time and how the trust that is part of our economy is either recovered or continues to unwind, you know, that gives me the most consternation, although I don't know what strategy to, to use on, on the back of it. And uh, Ken, how do you tail risk, right? You're, you're, you're vigilant for it. You're managing it. Do you do it through, is it, is it a question of your cash position? Is it out of the money options? Or tell us how you think so, about it. So, so those are all things that we do. We carry a huge cash position. Let me, let me just leave, close on one thought. Every crisis in the West for the last 50 years has been ultimately resolved by the intervention of government. There's a huge sea change though that has taken place in the West, which is in the European Union, the individual governments by and large no longer issue debt in their own currency. And so we have this moment in time where the U.S. government can always print dollars, and everybody knows it. It makes U.S. Treasuries risk-free in some sense. The risk of inflation is there, but the risk of default is not. But in Europe, Italy cannot print euros. Portugal cannot print euros. Spain cannot print euros. The ability of those countries as sovereigns to rescue their financial system in the next crisis is greatly diminished or not even there. And so that's, that's a huge change that has taken place in our lifetime that we've never seen the ramifications of. So if I were to say, is there, is there a crisis that we, are, that we are more concerned about than others, it's a crisis in continental Europe where because of the nature of the euro and the inability of countries to print their own currency, there can be a crisis which is too big for government as we think of it to solve. And that is frightening. 